first of all, I'm Sargon. Hello. I'm subscribed. I'm working on a um, university campus as a network engineer. And I, I really, really love combinatorical algorithms and all the stuff around that. So, yeah. What is it talk about? It's about the distributed DHCP demon. So, at first, we have a little look at what is DHCP and how it works. And then, the next step, how we, um, what challenges hits us when we like to transfer those concepts into mesh networks, especially if you have multiple client sites and stuff like that. And then we have a look at uh, algorithm, a yeah, so more informal look, and some details about the current implementation. So, at first, what is the ETP? The ETP stands for Dynamic Cost Configuration Protocol. And its initial um, definition is has been done in RFC 1521, which has been released in October 1993. That's about nearly 20 years ago. Uh, more than 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, what are the thought? Uh, before that date, configuration of Computer nodes in the network was was be done by T and other, other, other weird stuff. Or you really had to, to configure all your IP stuff statically. So the nice idea of TCP/HTTP is we have a service where the client can say hello, and some serv the server is answering, yeah, you are my network, so your configuration, and some more options and fun. And please keep that address only for two hours and then come back. So, yeah, it's, um, for IP4 networks, this, this is the established protocol for doing network configuration. And how does it work? So I have a little, little protocol overview, it's really wide. And it's, it's basically working by the client sending some dis discover packet over broadcast into the, in the layer 2 network and it's connected to it. And the server is entering, yeah, I can give you these details. Um, and then the client can say, yeah, I'd like to have them. And the server says, yeah, here you go. And here's the first problem. It's a broadcast. So if you have two servers in the network, both servers will say, yeah, I have an address here. And then you have a conflict, so the, the, the client can decide with which one it likes to talk. Uh, yeah. First come, first serve. No, 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 not that. It's client dependent. First no. offer? <laughs> or first technology? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, no, it's an offer. The offer is the same thing. The thing about it is clients can see, oh, oh this one gives me an address for 30 minutes, no, too early, and this one gives me a ah, winner server and at least one hour. You are my deal. So, a little bit complicated if you try to run um, enterprise networks and someone says, hey, I have this DHCP server too. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, looking back. Yeah, so in the usual way, you can only have one DHCP server in your network, and the only way to have fallback, if you don't want to screw up, is you have a second DHCP or the third, which always work in hot standby. So they do nothing until the first one fails. So um, the IC uh, DHCP server has some support for that, but uh, and all enterprise DHCP server stuff I have seen works around this mechanism and implement it by itself. A little bit weird. So, when we move into mesh networks, we have all these little nodes which have their own client medium, so the clients connect with wireless and the wireless network produce a node, and we have different nodes which all have their own little client medium. So in, in layer 2 networks, like, uh, like Batman, we connect all these things. But then we have one big layer 2 network and where's, where's the DHCP server? 
most most of the Batman networks have these central super nodes where some DCP server is, is running, and then there's a trick in Batman where Batman decides where the DHCP packets go. So they this on the interface, and every time a DHCP packet is coming, it selects oh, that's that's the best super node in my my network. I will direct the DHCP DHCP packet exactly to that node. So that's fine, but it's slow. Sometimes the distribution where the client is is slow. So you send your DHCP packet there, but the server didn't know where to send it back, so a packet loss. And the connection to the to the DHCP server stales and you have to repeat it and there's no no nice user experience. Especially if you want to drive mesh network without special super nodes. So in IPv6 we have this nice router advertisement stuff, we can do it on all nodes, send send it to the client realm, or clients see yeah there's there's this prefix, just configure it and it's fine. But in IPv4 we have to transport the the DHCP server also to the node, and then we have to get some agreement. So, which IP addresses do I share here? From which pool do I get IP addresses here? So the simple answer is here: yeah, I have a central authority where some guy sits, have a list, and yeah, okay, you can have this range. And then you can configure your, your nodes with the new range and so on. So, but that didn't work well for all the two networks, some kind of. So, yeah, it's a little bit confusing. So, you have a management problem. You always have, always have changing environment. So, at this point of time, that super node is really nice, lots of bandwidth, and at the next point of time, that other super node is very nice. So, which which gateway IP to, do you deliver? So, I need a, need a way to configure on, on one time, and not only that, we also have services which are now via a DHCP like DNS servers, NTP servers, WinS, and, and other weird stuff. So, I need to adjust. The things I, I give to the client at any time. Yeah, and then comes the, the fun things about mesh networks. We have roaming clients. They are not connected wired. So to the one in the same layer two network. No, no, they the, the run around and he connect to another node. And then then at some point they say, Yeah, okay, my lease is timed off. I like to have this address again. And in the, in the point where you have statically shared ranges, you say, no, I can't give you the address. Here you have a new one, or TCP connections away, and there you go. So, if you would like to give the client the same address again, you have to have a distributed database or distributed state. But distributed state consents is really, really hard, especially if you have packet loss. So, there are some papers about that, and you can. Those algorithms are always really, really complicated because they try to solve an uh, NPL hard problem. So, um, yeah, okay, forget that. And as I said before, we have time limitations, so when, when the client is, is requesting, he likes to have an answer, no. We want to solve the client really fast. Yeah. Um, that's for that. If you have any questions, just ask them. Now we come to the uh, ASPE algorithm. So the idea we had two and a half years, I think, ago, um, which, which has arrived from long from discussions about the topic. <coughs> Um, we, both, we, we construct a probabilistic algorithm which has no, no uh, real consents, fixed consents about the current state of the network, but 
it's a good some information about that and hopefully everybody learns at the time and stuff like that. So um, the first thing we say, okay, we have this this IP for four network where we like to share leases from. And we split that into, into blocks, many, many imprecise blocks. And those blocks are, can, we can enumerate. So say first block is zero, second block is one, and so on. And each block has a state. Which I can show you. Say, at the beginning, every block is kind of free. Then we have some some point where a block can be tentative, so some some node say say that's my block, and this will go over to claimed, and then we have timeout when we don't repeat it. That block is getting free again, and the block can be blocked. So if I have knowledge about static configured servers in my network, I can say. This block, we don't distribute data uh, leases from this block, so I don't have to, have to figure out how to handle many, many ranges. So, every node in the network, so in the, the constellation, has a unique ID. Currently, we have been generating them from the Mac of the interface with the uh, communication um, socket of the DBA. And yeah, so we can communicate uh, with, uh, with unique neighbors that you can identify. <laughs> so, what about communication in that setup? So, we have a form where the clients live, we communicate with IP4 there, and we have a back network where basically the mesh network where we can uh, communicate over IP4 6 multicast or in some cases unicast. So that's, that's really, really nice if we have IPv6 mesh only networks and don't want to clump in and out go around like we all know what the clients need that. So now, now we, we have some um, we have several operations we can do to update the distributed state. As I stated before, it's all, all blocks are fully ended to the and now we we have we, have, we may think we have one block. It's all in. Then we have to repeat some some claims every sixty seconds or so. So everybody in the know in the network know okay this block belongs to this node, and we multicast that that information to every other other node in the system. And all the other nodes who listen to that information may then uh, they say, yeah, okay, that block belongs to this node. And it's claimed. And uh, maybe, maybe, maybe some other block says, yeah, okay, you think that's a block, but that it is my block. I, I claimed that before. So we, we also need, need a way to handle that along. But that's uh, what about collisions? Yeah, we, we have a deciding rule here. No proceeds, smallest ID wins, so numericity. Second, we have no block or we, we need one. Then we have to inquire it. It's again a multicast message. But first we need to select one. So we have, we have some knowledge about the state. We can, can enumerate all the free ones, and we roll the dice and select one. And then we say, yeah, I like that. And we repeat that, that message three times. So maybe we have some packet loss, and then after three times, hopefully everyone has, has listened to our request, and no one has protested, but saying, no, that's mine. And then we can claim that log by sending an update claim. So we had to put the timeout, and, and now, now the interesting things. Now the interesting things. 
those clients come along and want, want some leads. So, client says discover, and um, the server is looking like, yeah, okay, I have this free, free um, release in one of my blogs, so I can do it directly. So, in practice, that are like 10 milliseconds, and we have your IP address. Really nice. So, then we have, yeah, we have the unfortunate um, problem of all clients. And the one client may maybe want to turn up A, and A says, yeah, okay, you, you want your address removed. So, the client is sending something new to you, which is basically a uh, uh, request with some such text on it. And then A can see the IP address. Yeah, okay, that IP address shall be in block X. And then, okay, block X is owned by node O. And yeah, okay, hey node O, I have a uh, Mac client here with, uh, with following Mac address and some other uh, stuff. And he likes to review you his IPs. Then uh, the node O can answer and say, yeah, okay. Give him that, that leads. I will update the timeout here and then A can transform that information into a real DHCP answer and give it to the client. Maybe, maybe node O is no longer in the network or it's not reasonable for some reason. Then we give the client no answer and at some time eventually the client would say, yeah, okay, uh, Maybe my old DHCP server isn't anymore, and I need to discover again. And then we can give it a new full address. Um, if you have many wrong signs, at one point in time you have a network where no client is at the node originally joins the network. So we will have many renew requests flowing around in the network. So you can say it's uh, some fragmentation of the network in that way. So then we, we decided to give an, another uh, feature. If a node is requesting another node for a renew, it's always implicitly asking to transfer the block. Node O, the only node, can then decide, okay, I know all my my clients are at that node or there's only one client in that block, then I transfer the ownage to the other block. Transferring that ownage is, is done by block O is forgetting about that this block is, is owned by him and is updating implicitly that the block is now owned by the other one, so he will stop to claim that. And the other node is just saying, hey, I claim that block in my update, and the original one is not protesting. Okay. Can I, what happens if you have multiple clients being assigned in the very same block, but then they the roll into different directions? Yeah, then the block stays at the owning node. What is the size of the block? Um, what typical sector? Uh, so, so two to four sector IP addresses. So okay. really small. We need that. Yeah. We need that. Some small subset. Yeah. Uh, we, we need that because we, we need to, to write all the numbers. So the probability that some node, which is not in, in contact with another node, selects the same block is really, really small. So in theory, currently distribute from a slash 20, I think, and the block size is 2. for the network is embedded, so I can decide is that other daemon really, really part of my network, and yeah, then senders nodes IP for six address, the holders nodes IP for six address, and some more information. 
then we have the DHT, the distributed DHCP part where we have the block indexes and timeout, and so we can in each claim update multiple <coughs> blocks. The current implementation uh, is looking something like there is there some some block I need to update in the next half timeout time, and then update that system. So we we defragmentate our repeating in the world where we need to update. So send a package to update our claims. And then there's the, the part where we handle our roaming information with other, uh, yeah, renew information with other clients uh, under nodes, and that's the second part. So we have to head up the second part and send that so to acquire a unique pass to another node. Especially the uh, parsing is uh, the least time is only used by the answer we know. Not by the good testing node. Yeah. And um, what's the XID? Uh, the XID is a unique identifier um, used in DHCP to identify a session with a client. So we send that along, and the RFC says you have to keep that uh, alongside with the client hardware address. So if you want to identify a lease, you had Given someone, you need the hardware address of the client, the XID, and you have the IP address of the client over this time. So, yeah, we need to transform all that. So, if you have a look in, in the RFC of DHCP, um, DHCP packets are really, really big because of their legacy. Um, DHCP sits on top of boot P and just uh, uses some fields of that, but you have to kind of 12 fields you have to carry. Packets are really, really big, so yeah, we swing sets to, to the minimum we need. Okay, then any any questions to that point? Sure. One more. Um, for your packet format, it means that all DHCP options are configured centrally. Right? No, 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 all DHCP options are configured on the node. So okay. each node can have different DHCP options okay. and must have them because each node may have another uh, opinion of which which uh, super node or DNS server or NTP server or whatever is best. Okay, but the protocol won't support to actually agree on them. You you set them each node on each node. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So when you roam, you can can get a completely different set of, of mm -hmm. options. Okay, makes sense. Uh, so in case of a renewal, um, so the, uh, the after a roaming, uh, the, the client roams to a, a node which uh, has a, a different gateway, yeah. uh, so a different set of options, and so he sends now a renewal request. What happens? He, yeah, he, he, he gets he, an acknowledge uh, with different parameters? Yeah, yeah. Okay. and he will so do it. Yeah, that's very yeah. fine. Um, we had that, that's a part in Vincent's talk where we talked about TCP connections will not break. Yeah. So I want to do node, he will give me a new, uh, after I renew, give me another gateway. And so the operating system will decide all the old TCP connections will, I will direct to that old gateway and the new ones I will direct to the new gateway. So there's no, no breaking in connections. Even if you can have better connections, but yeah. Okay. But the block size is a static thing, only nodes. Uh, yeah, yeah, you have for, to, for you have to agree size. on that in one mesh network. Okay. It's like you have to agree on the range you, you try to uh, want to share with your clients okay. and other wireless uh, aspects in the mesh network. Any, any more questions before I go to the implementation stage? No? Yeah. Uh, state of implementation is we have a working implementation available, dirty hex and fields, uh, some points in the code, and it's on GitHub. We also have some basic uh, integration into Gluon, basic because uh, some of the values in there are still fixed to, to the kids kill uh, from home setup. But we will fix that maybe this weekend. And 
Yeah, we have currently running setup with around 20 nodes um, inside that existing mesh network in Kiel, and it's working quite well. So you have a really, really nice user experience, uh, except the up table, uh, the distributed up table in um, Benjamin is kind of broken. To that state. So it's, it's a funny thing. Previous to that, you send you send your DHCP request and get no reply, and your your client is reconnecting, 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 uh, which didn't get better if you always you reconnect as a new MAC address. Um, and now you connect and instantly have an IP44 address, and then you're like, yay, I reached my home server, it's quite nice. And now I want to ask Google some, Google, hello. Um, yeah, then uh, after some, some long minutes, uh, the server, yeah, okay, now I know where you are here, here, your reply packages. So, yeah, still working on that. So the, so the online detection or uh, the internet connectivity detection of uh, some Android phones may be a bit dazzled about the, yeah, yeah, the, the yeah. network, which so, is... So, and sometimes it takes some, some minutes yeah. until the X is disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we... Yeah, try it. Try it, give me feedback. And, um, as we see in the, the talks from Vincent and Christoph, we have some layer 3 uh, network thing going up where we can integrate this uh, even in the setup. And um, currently working on some box things, so every time the DHCP server is doing some, some release uh, handling, it can invoke another process and uh, message something. This Linux is also very happy about because um, the dot table fixing thing he is working on now with some DHCP packets on super nodes, and now um, with the demon, the DHCP packets no longer go through a dead Batman network, and he has nothing to snoop. So uh, when when we give out a lease, we can say, yeah, here Batman, update your dot table. We have a new client, or remove it when the timeout has, has been happening. Uh, this is already working. Uh, that, that part of the feature, yeah. no, I'm, I'm just working on the hook thing. Okay. So maybe, maybe end of this weekend. So, any more questions? How big is it? How big is it? Um, it doesn't fit for my cup of tea. It fits into a bottle of milk. I, I think I uh, on the, on get the it down to, to 20, 20 kilobytes, something like that. But uh, I think that will change over time a little bit. And if it gets too big, we need to shrink it again. So, yeah. I also had a look into having nearly constant memory usage. So, when the configuration comes into the static part of configuration, I really require memory one time and don't resize it every time. So, doesn't defrag the memory of those small devices. <laughs> yeah, then thank you. Okay. <laughs>